Scott Morrison here to talk to us. Um, so Scott is a senior lecturer at the Biomedical uh, Sciences Institute at ANU. Um, his interests are pharmacology and drug topological quantum field theories, small examples of subfactors and fusion categories. Um, he received his PhD in 2007 with Vaughan Jones in Berkeley, um, UC Berkeley, and then moved to Station Q at UC Santa Barbara um, for a postdoc in 2009, and then he was a Miller Fellow back in Berkeley in 2012, and then moved to Canberra. So, take it away, Scott. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, this talk is about, about knots and quantum computation. And uh, I can remember right at the beginning that this talk is, uh, is an attempt to sort of explain some of the bigger picture around the work that I do. But a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here, I actually don't know very much about. In particular, uh, I've heard that there's one of the computer scientists in the audience, and if I say something completely stupid and wrong, feel free to tell me so we can all learn from the mistakes that I've made uh, addressing the, some of the things about quantum computation. Um, yeah, okay, so let's get started. So if uh, you only take away one sentence from this talk, it's, uh, it's this sentence that you can read from the titles of the different sections here. So the Jones polynomial, whatever that is, we're going to go talk about it in a moment, is as hard as quantum computation. And moreover, we can actually calculate the Jones polynomial using something called topology field theory. And the, at the end of the day, this is a story about how maybe we can really go and build an actual quantum computer. Uh, but it's also got a lot of fabulous mathematics along the way. And the, even if, uh, even if the quantum computers on our desks don't work out, uh, there's some, some worthwhile things to think about. Okay, so let's start talking about what on earth the Jones polynomial is. So the Jones polynomial uh, is an invariant of lengths. So here's a, so if this is a little bit small, there's a picture of a knot on this, a piece of a string. Uh, it's tied up in some complicated way. Uh, when, when mathematicians talk about knots and lengths, they always mean a, a circle of rope embedded in space somehow, so we know what it means to say it's just a closed piece of rope. And for now, I mean, well, what sort of thing is the Jones polynomial? It's just a little machine that takes a knot or a link and spits out a polynomial. Well, a Laurent polynomial, the, the exponents of the polynomial can be, can be named. So uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about what exactly it means to mean invariant of links in a moment, but let's just give the definition right away. Uh, it turns out that even though the discovery of the Jones polynomial was a sort of uh, serendipitous and surprising thing, there's actually a really simple definition of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy to understand gadget. It's entirely defined by these two rules here. So what do these rules say? Well, you start with your knot, it's your link, it's a, uh, a picture of a knot or a link drawn on the plane, and you just Take any crossing you like, where the two pieces of the string cross over each other, and replace that crossing with a linear combination of two different pictures. So we're going to be working now with formal linear combinations of pictures that look like knots. Okay, so you take a, a single knot and you replace it with this linear combination of some formal variable called A times, times uh, one resolution of that crossing plus uh, one over A times this other resolution. <coughs> we'll, we'll do an example in a moment. Uh, and then you can keep doing this every time maybe there are more crossings in the knot besides the first one you met. You can do this again, and so now you'll have a total of four terms in your linear combination, and, and on and on and on. And then if you think about what a, uh, what a knot looks like that has no crossings in it at all, it's just a bunch of circles drawn on the plane. And the rule is that you can, you can take one of these circles out, but you just have to multiply whatever you've got so far by this little polynomial negative a squared negative a to the minus two. And it's a little unfortunate. Uh, I'm going to be at different parts of the talk using two different variables to talk about this thing. I've given this definition, so we end up with some of our own polynomial in the variable a. One second. Yep. Uh, but up here, I wrote a Laurent polynomial in q. It's going to be convenient to use both of them. So there's a translation. q is just negative a squared. Yes. Yeah. So check if you, you know, untangle that one. Don't you say that? Yep. Would it be minus a squared minus a minus two squared? Is that what it is? 
square it. Yeah. So this is a this is a this is a, a multiplicative rule that says if you see a circle and some other piece of the diagram beside it, you take whatever this diagram evaluates to and multiply it by one. That's the one square rule. Okay, so let's go in and actually calculate the Jones polynomial for a knot, so we can all see what we're talking about. Uh, I've got the the rules defining it written up there in the, in the top right corner. So let's first of all prove a little that. Let's say that we see somewhere in our knot just a little kink, uh, a twist in the, in, the, in the piece of rope. Well, we take that crossing and we resolve it in the two different ways. We get this linear combination A times this diagram plus A inverse times this diagram. And we see this diagram is a little circle, so we replace that with negative A squared, negative A to the minus 2, and one of those terms just cancels out with that term, and we have negative A cubed times this term. Okay? So, what we can see here is that each time we see a little kink, we can basically forget it. We just have to keep track of a little factor of negative a cubed. And a very similar calculation with the other way that a string <coughs> kink uh, turns out to give negative a to the minus 3 times the uh, straight piece of rope. Okay, so once we've got that lemma in hand, we can actually do a calculation. Uh, can people actually see this knot? Uh, so this is the this is the hot link. It's the, the simplest knot made out of two pieces of rope. So you should call it a link rather than a knot. And what we're going to do is look at that top crossing and resolve that crossing. So we get a times some diagram plus a inverse times the diagram where we resolve the crossing the other way. And now we're going to apply our lemma twice, once on each of the diagrams. If you look carefully and use the right hand rule in the right way, you'll see that this one has got a twist like in the first case, and this diagram has got a twist like in the second case. So we can just untwist it and put in negative a cubed, untwist this guy and put in negative a to the minus 3, and we get this. We replace each of these circles with that factor that is, is associated with the circle, and we end up with some of the wrong polynomial in a, which we can alternatively write as the wrong polynomial in q, that change the rate. Okay, so you can see if I give you any particular diagram of a knot, you can go away and follow these sort of rules. So let's now say exactly what it means to be an invariant of lengths. So the thing to notice is that this recipe I gave you for calculating the Jones polynomial, uh, you're not actually working with like, a piece of string sitting out here in space. We're working with a, a piece of string laid down on the table. I mean, we're working with flat diagrams drawn on the table. Now, you can take the same knot, some piece of string up here, and put it down on the table in many different ways. So we need to make sure that the answer that we get out of the end of the day doesn't depend on the way that we drew the knot. So um, it turns out that uh, we can exactly say how different diagrams of the same knot differ. If two links are isotopic, that is, you can just rearrange one into the other, then in fact you can do that rearrangement via a sequence of very simple moves, called the randomizing moves. So uh, for some reason I've left out randomizer 1. Uh, randomizer 1 says that you can take a kink in a strand and remove it. But remember, we couldn't do that for our invariant. Uh, you could have picked up this factor of minus a cubed. All of that means is that this is an invariant of, of ribbon knots. You have to keep track of whether they're, they're twisted or not. Uh, so the, the invariants that we care about. Anyway, a randomizer 2 and 3. So what does randomizer 2 say? Well, uh, I don't know if you can see these two pictures on the left and the right here. I realize they're a little small. Here are just two parallel strands somewhere inside the picture of our knot. But up here, We've just passed one string over the other one. Okay. And obviously, two knots that differ like that are really the same knot, so we better check that we get the same answers. So, what do we do? We just apply the formula for calculating the Jones polynomial to this little picture here. It's got two crossings, so we expand it out, there are four terms, we follow the rules, and we see that everything simplifies down, we've got the same answer as we would have got for the simple knot with the same parallels. Okay. So, this, this definition we've given is invariant under this right hand statistic. Randomizer 3 is a bit more complicated, it looks like that. Uh, so I'll leave as an exercise for anyone who doesn't want to listen to the rest of the talk uh, to work out how you check if the Jones polynomial really gives the same answers for those two pieces. If you just look at this, you might think, geez, I've got to expand out and, and get two to the three terms on either side and check everything works out. And there are actually much sneakier and easier ways to prove Randomizer 3. Uh, so yeah, it, it is actually a fun exercise. It's not just hard work. Okay. So there's the Jones problem. Uh, find it, show you how to calculate it, and explain 
at least a little bit of why I'm doing this and very interesting. Okay, so the Drake's polynomial when it was discovered by Jones uh, back in 1984 was really a big deal. It was a it was a it was a, it was a big surprise. It wasn't the sort of thing that people were expecting. Uh, and the the discovery of the of this of this invariant you know, led to lots of interesting new things. Uh, people learned lots of things about free manifold topology, about quantum physics, about quantum field theory, and then People later have, have uh, found applications of Jones polynomial in other fields where, where knots matter. Yeah. People who study how loops of DNA get knotted care about uh, the Jones polynomial often. But what I want to talk about today is what on earth the Jones polynomial has to do with computer science and dense matter physics. And uh, to see these connections, we have to start thinking about how hard it is. To Now, in some sense, you might think what we already know. I sort of implicitly told you an algorithm for computing the Jones polynomial, like these organ crossings and simplifying and so on. But it's easy to see that sort of the algorithm you get from doing that is really bad. I mean, if, if, a, cross, if, a, if a diagram of a knot had n crossings, you would expect that to expand out to the n terms to get the answer. So it's going to be exponential in time and in space and, and, and uh, a bad thing. It turns out that there are ways to compute the Jones polynomial or at least ways to compute the Jones polynomial at particular values of Q that are much more efficient, but they're also still hard, and hard in a really interesting way. And that is that the Jones polynomial is as hard as quantum computation. So what this is going to mean is that if you had a quantum computer, I'm going to say what a quantum computer is, if you had a quantum computer, you'd be able to compute the Jones polynomial quickly, that is, in polynomial time, with respect to the complexity of the knot. But conversely, if you're good at computing the Jones polynomial, or the Jones polynomial evaluated at certain values of Q, and for what it's good at, you can do this in polynomial time, then you can do everything that a quantum computer would have been able to do. Okay, so these are the, 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 the Jones, computing the Jones polynomial is equivalently difficult as doing anything that a quantum computer would do. And the point of most of this talk is to try and justify that equivalence. Why it's an exciting observation about the Jones polynomial and quantum computation. Okay, so what is quantum computation anyway? Uh, so this is where we start getting into the part of the talk where computer scientists are welcome to uh, correct some of the things that I say. Okay, so a, a decision problem. So this just means that it just means a function which takes some inputs, maybe like a, a string of bits, and the, the function L has to spit out yes or no. Does this, string, does this string of bits count as, as, a, as a valid string of bits? Okay. So we say that a, a decision problem is in VQP, the guess stands for bounded quantum probabilistic. Uh, anyway, the bounded and. No, uh, actually, I actually guess it's, it's quantum in there somewhere. Okay. So a decision problem is in VQP if there is a uniform bound of quantum circuits, Q and N. Say what all that means in a moment. So that well, there's this whole family QN uh, indexed by n dimension. So the n circuit QN takes in n bits and just spits out one bit, the yes or the no. But it does this probabilistically. Okay, the, on the same input, it's allowed to give different answers each time. But the the condition on this on this circuit Q is that when we put in it, we, we have an input x. Well, we're meant to, so x is some string of bits. We're meant to feed it to the nth quantum circuit where n is the length of this string of bits and see what it says, or at least measure the probabilities with which it says yes or no. And if x, uh, if L of x is false, then that probability is maybe relatively low, less than a third will do. Whereas if x is, if L of x is true, the circuit is meant to most of the time uh, uh, say yes. So it doesn't have to always give an answer, but with uh, with some inequality, it's going to mostly get the answer right. And now we have to say what exactly that means to be a quantum circuit. Okay. So you're, a problem is in DQP if you can show me this family of quantum circuits that, that probabilistically replicates the, the answers of, the, of that decision problem. Okay. So a quantum circuit is just like a classical circuit, which you think it's built out of gates and wires connecting 
except that instead of dually and look at gates can rise up, we have an unitary operator. So here's a little picture that's meant to show you a generic example of a quantum circuit. So think of this as having a sort of hollow parallel line, sort of wires in a circuit, and they enter some rectangles, which are the, the quantum gates. And uh, what you should think of is that each line here is carrying a two-dimensional vector space on it. So when you have a bunch of lines next to it, it's carrying the tensor product of those vector spaces. So if I have what, one, two, three, uh, seven lines down there, that's carrying a 128-dimensional vector space. Okay? And now, when you see some lines entering and leaving a box, you think of that box as being labeled by some unitary operator acting on that vector space. So here, V has five input strings and five output strings. So it's some 32 by 32 unitary matrix. Okay? Stick in a vector here, you uh, take its first five tensor factors and pass it through that unitary, then that unitary, and then pass two of the factors through that unitary, and so on. Okay. So the whole thing, the whole composition here, ends up being just some unitary operator. Input string, uh, vector space on the input strings, the vector space on the output strings. Okay. Uh, so, what do you do with a quantum circuit? Well, when I give you some string of bits uh, of, of, of uh, length 7, uh, you're meant to uh, prepare a vector to start working with. So, so in your favorite two-dimensional vector space, pick two basis vectors, orthogonal basis vectors, which you're going to call 0 and 1, and so given a bit string now, we prepare a vector, which is uh, Zero, 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 one, 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 one. We just prepare zero tensor, zero tensor, zero tensor, one tensor, one tensor. One tensor. Okay. So you apply all the unitaries, and you get some vector out at the end, and you well, you, you, can, you can probabilistically measure the output of, of, of this little circuit. But what that means in terms of the, the, the formulas of quantum mechanics is that you just uh, have some basis vector in this final uh, this final quantum space, and you just measure the inner product. Interpret that, that or the, the absolute value squared of that unit product as the probability of getting a certain output. Okay. So hopefully this makes sense what a quantum circuit is. So uh, when we have this family of, sorry, I think I skipped through too, but it didn't really uh, When you have this family of quantum circuits, the nth quantum circuit is one with n strings uh, of uh, however many unitary operators you want to have. Now we have to say what uniform family means. Because we have to make sure that we're not cheating and having uh, sort of hiding enormous complexity in the higher, in the bigger and bigger circuits. So uniform just means that uh, this family QN uh, has a classical algorithm that runs on a normal old-fashioned computer like we have today that runs in polynomial time outputting the end quantum circuit. So we really have to, that means we just have a, a compact, straightforward description of all these circuits, and there's, there's no cheating going on hiding the hardware that can actually same what the circuits are. Okay. So that is meant to be a description of what quantum computation is. We, we, we expect that anything that we build that could be affected, that should ought to be called a quantum computer, has this mathematical description. And the question is, uh, we all know we can actually build things that are that are just quantum computers. So what can quantum computers do for us? Well, not that much. Uh, it is sort of a sad story, but, but also a very interesting one. You read a lot of garbage in, uh, in newspapers and, and Scientific American and New Scientist. And pop <laughs> the vast majority of people who try and write popular things about quantum computing just say stupid stuff. Uh, and it's very important um, because yeah, it's sad hearing these stupid things. They're not exponentially parallel. They don't take all possible inputs and run them in parallel separately and then magnitude of like um, Doing something useful with a quantum computer takes much more work than that. And you need to, you, you, need, to, uh, <laughs> you need to really uh, think carefully and do a whole lot more work than your individual problems. Quantum computers are not general purpose programmable devices like computers on our desks and our pockets are. Uh, they really do very, very specific things. And so on that note, in particular after having complained about newspapers, I just want to tell you about this guy, Scott Aronson, who, who says that he studies 
what computers we don't have yet can't do. <laughs> he, I mean, he, he, he tries to work out what quantum computers can't do. He tries to understand the outer limits of what quantum computers can possibly achieve. But in particular, he writes very, very well on the subject. Um, there's a, he's written great articles for the New York Times. He has a fantastic blog. And if you want to learn about quantum computing, uh, I strongly encourage you to look up his left-hand notes, read his articles, and it's, a, it's both an entertaining and uh, very well-explained way to learn about quantum computing. Okay. So they can't do that much, but they can do some things. And so I just want to quickly say some of those things. They can do unstructured search of squared n time. So say I just give you a huge list of phone numbers. Well, phone numbers is a bad example. Let's just say phone numbers, but I, I put them in random order. I haven't even bothered to sort them really. And then I ask you uh, what position is Aiden's phone number on this list. Obviously, the best you can do is look through the list until you see Aiden's phone number and see what position that was. So it's going to take time proportional to the length of the list. And somewhat surprisingly, one of the first things that you can do with a quantum computer is solve that problem in time proportional to the square root. But that's not much of a speed up. That's just square root n versus n. One of the things that they can do that's really dramatic is factor integers in polynomial time. Uh, I mean, we don't really know how long it takes to factor integers uh, with a classical computer, but we expect that it can't be done in polynomial time. And this is really the famous application of quantum computers, and that is usually the first one we get in the for Shor's algorithm. And it's a bunch of generalizations about finding discrete blocks and groups and things like that. But this is somehow sort of one of the one of the very interesting applications. Okay, another thing that it can do is the efficient simulation of quantum systems, uh, and this uh, this one doesn't get talked about so much when people want to write about quantum computing, but it's a really big deal. Uh, if you go and ask you know, your your friends who study neurons, your friends who study high temperature superconductors, your friends who study uh, pretty much what well, electric chemistry. Chem and you told them, hey, I can efficiently simulate quantum systems, their jaws will drop and they'll, and they'll be your best friend right away because this is a, this is a, a big difficult problem uh, running simulations of quantum mechanical systems with our current computers and we will, if we can ever build a quantum computer, we will get dramatically better at it and we will know how to build high temperature superconductors and we will just be able to simulate all the candidate ones instead of building them, see how they work and understand the details and uh, if you really, if you pay off but the other thing they can do is they can evaluate the universe. Okay? And uh, maybe this sounds silly compared to the previous point, who cares about evaluating some non invariant information? <laughs> and I need to justify why this is also a big deal that they can evaluate the universe. Okay. So I actually need to justify this claim now that the Jones polynomial is as hard as quantum computation. And to do that, uh, we're going to have to prove two things. First, we're going to have to uh, come up with a quantum algorithm for evaluating the Jones polynomial. And then we're going to have to explain how any quantum algorithm can be encoded as the problem of evaluating some Jones polynomial. So let's do the first bit first. Uh, a quantum algorithm for the Jones polynomial. Uh, at this point, I guess it becomes slightly, uh, slightly technical in some sense. So, okay, so what's the statement of this theorem? We take a braid, B. What is a braid? We better go explain that. Uh, some of you may know what braids are, and you'll already know the definition, but these pictures suffice for anyone who doesn't already know what a, what a braid is. These sorts of pictures, which are all braids, this thing here is not a braid. Okay, it's a bunch of strings going from left to right or top to bottom that always just continue going from left to right. They can cross over each other, but they can't ever turn back. Go back in the same direction. These two blades are considered different. Even though the strings are connected up in the same way, that point is connected to that point, and that point is connected to that point further, the crossings are different, so we have to consider them differently. These, on the other hand, are the same blade. They look like quite different pictures, but if you take some, what's that string that goes from the top point on the left and the second top point on the right, pull it straight, you get a straight line. Okay. So that's what braids are. Uh, you might notice that two braids form a group. You can take two braids on the same number of strings and stick them next to each other, and you get some new braid, and that's more flotation in, in the group. A little bit more thought tells you what the inverse of the braid is in that group. Uh, 
this one with the infrastructure in the And a nice fact is that you can take any novel link and present it as what's known as a flat boom. So inside this golden box here is some grade, all the students are just going top to bottom. And we go on get a bunch of cups on the bottom, a bunch of caps on the top. So that's a, a closed thing. So it's a, a novel link. And every novel link can be written this way. Inside the box is a grade. And it's got simple on the outside. And that's going to allow us to most of what we like grades is like we're talking about nuts and numbers. Okay, so back to the theorem. We take a grade B with n strands and n crossings. And let's select some root of unity. Pi over k. This is a pi over k, pi i over k, and a, and a tolerance epsilon. So the theorem just says that there's a quantum algorithm running in. It's a polynomial in n, m, k, and one over epsilon, meaning that sort of a, I rack down all of this data here as the input to my quantum algorithm. Okay? And this quantum algorithm approximates the Jones polynomial of the flat closure of that grade evaluated at this particular root of unity to within epsilon. Okay? It's going to give us an additive approximation to, to some evaluation of epsilon. And so just uh, turn into this theorem properly. Uh, the, the little description I'm going to give of this theorem is due to uh, uh, Aronoff on Jones and Seth Landau. Uh, but in some sense, they're, they're following an earlier paper, which did something uh, more general than this theorem says. Their paper is called the simulation of topological field theories by quantum physics. They proved much more than just you can approximate the Jones polynomial. Uh, but somehow this paper is. is much, much harder to read, has, has significant prerequisites, and doesn't really very explicitly tell you what the algorithm is. Uh, whereas this one is, uh, is, 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 is very straightforward. Okay. So let's just think roughly how this, uh, how this quantum algorithm is going to work. So there's this thing called the, the path model for the Jones polynomial. So for the path model, we're going to have to introduce this vector space we'll call Hn, which consists of linear combinations of paths of length n on some particular graph a k minus 1. So this graph a k minus 1 is something very, very simple. It's just this linear graph of k minus 1 vertices in n dimension. It's called that name because it was a big compact. Now, just recall what the parameter k was. k is the root of the order of the root of n. Twice the order of the root of n that we're after. That we're looking at. So we're looking at paths on this graph of, of, of length n. And so let me just show you what these paths actually look like for a little example. So here we're looking at paths of length a to b. And the, the paths are represented by uh, sort of tying as across the x axis here as you move along the path. And where you are on the graph is the y axis. So this is just a path to starts at one end of the graph, goes all the way out as far as it can in four steps, and then it comes all the way back. Now, uh, there are 14 paths of length eight that start and end at, at uh, one end of the graph, but uh, that's not always true. If k had been some very small number, so we're looking at a very short graph, maybe this one would have been impossible, because there, there, there might not be four, you might be able to go four steps out on the graph. Okay. But once k has been enough, we'll be being scrapped, we'll be these paths of length eight, more paths and other things. Okay. So that's the, this little vector space we have to have in mind uh, to describe the path model. And the point is that there's a uh, there's a there's a, a representation of this grade group on that vector space so that we can calculate the Jones polynomial of a flat closure of the grade in the following way. So you take the grade, you, you act on this vector space according to that representation, and then you take, uh, well, sorry, you, you, you take some fixed vector z, which I'm not going to describe, but it, it corresponds to those cups at the bottom of a flat diagram. You act on it in this vector space by that grade, and then finally you compute the inner product again with that fixed vector z. That gives you some complex number, and the uh, 
the little theorem about the path model, that that complex number is the Jones one and the Jones type of the Okay. So now, what we're going to do is take this vector space HN and embed it inside a larger vector space. So we're going to encode each path as a sequence of ups and downs, whether we're moving further out along that, that AK graph or back in. And so we can think of each path as giving us some vector in this, in this vector space, which looks like this two-dimensional vector space spanned by up and down to the nth tens of hours. Okay? Uh, so for example, in that, uh, that example we did before, we're embedding this 14-dimensional space of paths in one of eight in this 256 dimensional. Now, this grade group action we have on HN doesn't quite act locally with respect to this tensor product structure. So you're acting locally with what I mean is that, say you've got these, these N tensor factors in this vector space, so this is like X1, tensor X2, tensor X3, tensor X4. Say I had some vector. Sitting inside, uh, this plane is very good. sitting inside this two dimensional vector space to the fourth tensor power. And say I looked at the grade, they crossed over the, uh, the second and third strands. I would say that, this, that the grade representation was local in this big tensor product. If I could work out, how, work out how this acted, just looking at x2 and x3. And it was just the identity on, on x1 and x4. So it only modified x2 and x3 and the Fourier tensors. Now, in this, in this representation of the grade group, they don't act locally in this way, but they almost do. They act almost locally. That is, when you act on a grade on the second and third strings, it only modifies these two vectors. And it depends very weakly on the, on the vectors in the earlier parts of the tensor factor. And they depend on those through the height of the path up to that point. So the vectors along here you can think of as being some sequence of ups and downs, because you just calculate the difference, the total of ups minus total of downs. It's the height of the path at that point. And then the action of the grade group here affects these two factors in some way depending on that height. Okay. So we just we, we now have a sort of clue about how to build a quantum circuit that does all this. We need to add log k extra registers to our quantum computer to keep track of the heights of the path. So why why log k well, k is the maximum height that we can be at, and so log k is how much space it takes to record the height of the path. So here's a picture of how you achieve this. You have your, your qubits here that keep track of whether the path is going up or down, and you have these extra log k qubits which are drawn in this big line. You put us through a preliminary phase where you uh, just count how many of these qubits are up and how many are down, Store the total in this extra, this other register, this, this thick line register. And then when it's time to do one particular crossing of the grade, well, you can act by a, a quantum gate that only interacts with those two strings that it's going to be acting on, also these extra log k registers that keep track of what time we're at, and then for, for a technical reason, once we're done acting by the grade, we have to sort of clear this auxiliary register again and, and, and uh, set it back to zero, which we do by So this now is a little quantum circuit that, uh, that, that performs a single crossing from the grade by sticking a whole chunk of those together. We obtain a, a quantum circuit that, uh, that gives you the action of any given grade on this vector space. And then by calculating this inner product, which is just some quantum measurement, we get an evaluation of the Jones Okay, so that's one direction. We can evaluate the Jones quantum more efficiently uh, using using the quantum circuit model. And you should just notice that the number of gates we used in this little description was polynomial in the size of the grade. We had to use as many chunks like this one as there were crossings in the grade, but the total number of gates is higher because we might have to, the number of little counter gates we used along here depended on the, the width of the, the grade here. So you can see how it's polynomial in both N and N. Okay. What about the other direction? Maybe the, the less plausible looking direction. How do you uh, encode a quantum algorithm, an arbitrary quantum algorithm, as a grade? <coughs> so, this 
So the, the theorem here is that given any VQP problem, L, and fixing any root of unity, e to the pi i over k, as long as k is either 5 or greater than or equal to 7, there's, there's, there's a very good explanation for that, which I guess I can get to maybe later. Uh, then, we can construct some grade, so we'll, given any input x, that we're going to stick into the, the BQP problem, we can quickly construct some grade V sub x corresponding to that input with n strands so that the absolute value of the Jones polynomial of that grade with some little normalizing fudge factor, the absolute value of that Jones polynomial is less than one third whenever, uh, whenever L of x is true and is greater than two thirds whenever L of x is false. And so what you can see here uh, is that if you can efficiently evaluate these left-hand sides here, then you can efficiently mimic the, the responses of this BQP problem. So this theorem gives us the universality result for, uh, for, for BQP. Okay, so this is uh, a theorem uh, essentially proved by Friedman, Larson, Larson and Wang, and uh, has a, a, a nice and easy to follow proof that simplifies a few things by Aronova. So roughly, how is this, is this encoding meant to work? Okay, so we've got to look at one of these quantum circuits that we know we've got corresponding to this BQP decision problem. And we're allowed to assume that it only uses two qubit gates, gates that cross over two strands at once. It's a, an easy exercise, either in quantum computing or linear algebra, to realize that any quantum circuit can be built out of one of them. Now, again, let's look at this, uh, this same vector space as we had before. Uh, paths of length L on this, uh, on this graph AK minus 1. And again, uh, we have this, this representation of the gradient on that vector space. Now we're going to do something sort of dual to what we did before. Previously, we took that vector space AKN and embedded it up inside some bigger tensor product vector space. And now we're going to do the opposite again. We're going to embed some tensor product vector space into one of these AKMs. So what, what, what is this embedding? We'll take this uh, two to the n dimensional vector space here, which you could think of as having a basis consisting of bit strings of length n, and we'll embed it into this space of paths in the following way. Every time you see a zero, take the path that just goes up, down, up, down, and every time you see a one, take the path that goes up, up, down, down. Okay? So you can obviously, uh, these paths you can obviously Catenate because the starts and ends of these paths are at the initial point of the graph. You can always just keep these paths together. And that defines some, some uh, linear map in the special space into H sub 4 A, which is the usual four steps in each path to encode each bit. And now the, the bit of, uh, uh, well, a, a bit of work that you need to go and do uh, is that in this encoding, you can actually approximate any two qubit gate by some eight strand grid. So if you, you should just check that two and eight match up right, there are two bits for embedding in paths of length h. And another way of saying this is just that uh, when you think about this eight strand grid group acting on, on h8 with this four dimensional subspace in it, all that we're saying is that any unitary operator acting on that four dimensional strand and taking that four dimensional subspace to itself can be approximated by some grade. So this is some denseness result. It's saying that the grade group inside the unitary operators on this thing has, has density. And uh, then uh, a, 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 a nice theorem says that when you have this, this group, the, the, when, you have, when the grade group has a dense image, some Lie group, the, this group of unitary matrices, then in polynomial time, you can actually pick a point arbitrarily close to the point of the graph. So that you actually need to know that you can go from this denseness result to, to in polynomial time, picking a good approximation. Okay. Once you have this back, then you can just approximate the entire circuit. Each two bit, each two qubit gate, you approximate by some eight strand grade acting on, on a different set of eight strands. So you can have some picture. Of this, we will be approximating this one. Uh, 
false again. Okay, so the first query acts on these eight strands and does something else. Sorry, I'm rambling on this one. It's a whole key. So this first two do it daily. Mixes out these first eight strands in some complicated way, while leaving this four strand in the bottom the same, and then the second qubit, the second two qubit get reapproximated by some eight strand gray that acts on the uh, on the, uh, the bottom of the eight strand, leaving the top four strands. Okay. Okay. So that gives us the uh, the some gray corresponding to the entire circuit. You need to do a little bit of work to convert inputs and outputs. Um, and just relating the fact that um, we need to sort of take some unitary that takes our chosen input to this standard, I should have written Z, it was the same Z as on the other slide, the standard vector in, in HN that corresponds to that flat closure and it gets another little unitary for getting the output set up right. And then you just have this formula at the end which is that uh, the, this quantum mechanical amplitude that we're meant to be measuring uh, in the definition of BQP is exactly uh, the, evaluate, the evaluation of the Jones polynomial of the flat closure of this gray field. And so uh, if you have a fast approximation of this, you have a fast way of simulating the, the, the chosen input. Okay, so we've now seen both parts of this. Quantum, uh, evaluating the Jones polynomial really is exactly as hard as quantum computation. So that's a fun exercise, maybe, but what's it actually for? Well, the point is that whether or not we have quantum computers, we've got a strategy for evaluating the Jones polynomial using actual physics. And this is this comes from topological field theory. So the point is that there are actual physical systems which can directly calculate the Jones polynomial. So of course the point is now that if those physical systems can directly calculate the Jones polynomial, in principle we should be able to have those physical systems perform quantum computation for us. So what is a topological field theory? A topological field theory in two plus one dimensions is a little gadget that associates to each surface, torus, disk with some punches in it, some Hilbert space, the surface sigma, the Hilbert space CMC. And to each cobordism, the cobordism here is some three dimensional manifold that has two pieces of boundary. Those boundary of each two manifolds, you can think of them as coming down and outgoing boundary. So a very simple cobordism might just be solar and cylinder. You can think of it as having incoming boundary in its lower disk, an outgoing boundary in that upper disk. Uh, or um, another one. Torus, and uh, uh, you're going to have a three dimensional cobordism which is the solid torus, thought of as a cobordism from the empty two manifold to the torus as the outgoing boundary. And uh, so, topological field theory to each cobordism is meant to give you a unitary operator from the Hilbert space associated with the incoming boundary to the Hilbert space going to the outgoing Now, gray groups are, are the mapping class groups of future disks. What does that mean? Well, if you have some gray, you can interpret that as a cobordism from a disk with some number of punches back to that disk by taking, so taking this cylinder over the disk with five punches and you can fill out a little neighborhood of each of the screens. So now there are these tubes cut out from the solid, uh, from the solid cylinder and that's on three manifold with incoming boundary and punch and disk and outgoing. And so according to this little formalism, uh, a TQFT in two plus one dimensions is going to give us some unitary representation of the grade group of the any strand grade group on the disk with any functions. Okay. The fixed Hilbert space is whatever associates with the disk, and every grade interpreted as a cobordism to get the corresponding unitary operator. So the beautiful theorem is that the, uh, the Jones polynomial arises in exactly this way. That is, there exists a topological field theory. All of this guy here. So that, oh, uh, well, actually, sorry, rather, for each root of unity, K, uh, there exists a different topological field theory, 
assume that you could evaluate the Jones polynomial at the closure of some grade at that root infinity simply by taking some particular vector in that Hilbert space corresponding to a function disk, applying the grade to it, and taking the quote again to that disk space. And so uh, these, these topological field theories associated with the Jones polynomial were uh, first discovered or indicated or something by uh, Wigan and then uh, given a precise mathematical formulation by Richard and Dryden. And uh, they also gave huge generalizations of, of the setup and described a whole lot of other topological field theories in our theory associated with Jones polynomial. Okay. So now we've got yet another gag joke that can evaluate the Jones polynomial for us on these topological field theories. And the surprise in fact is that there's actually some honest physics in this. Namely that there are, there are, there are, there are real physical systems whose, uh, whose behavior seems to be described by some of these, these, these topological field theories. Namely the, the fractional quantum ball. So there are, the, the fractional quantum ball effect, ball effect so what, what, what's the ball effect? Some, some physics background. And if you, if you have a, a, a wire, and you run a current down it, and you apply an external magnetic field, those, those charges moving down the wire, are charges moving in a magnetic field, so they feel a force that pushes them sideways, and so you can actually detect a little, uh, a little potential across the thickness of the wire, just because the charge carriers, which are moving, uh, which are negatively charged, are being pushed to one side of the wire. Okay. Now, if you think about it, that potential that you see across the wire should be proportional to everything inside the strength of the magnetic field, the, the, the charge that's flowing. But it turns out that when you crank the temperature down very low and the magnetic field up very, very high, you see something called the, the integer quantum ball effect, where the potential across the wire becomes a little step function. It goes in integer steps uh, as you change the magnetic field. And then when you go to extremely low temperatures, you see not just the integer fractional, the, the integer quantum ball effect, but a fractional quantum ball effect, where there are all these crazy little plateaus where as we map up the magnetic field, we see some integer levels, there's three and there's two, but then there are some crazy rational numbers where you see other things like seven thirds, five halves, eight thirds, and then scratch and see even more numbers. And it appears that some of these fractional levels are very well described by certain topological field theories. The five halves state, which is quite well understood in people who really know it in the lab, Unfortunately, it seems to correspond to the k equals 4 topological field theory. And if you remember back to that universality result we had a few pages ago, the condition was that either k was 5 or bigger than 7. So, unfortunately, this one is no good. But it looks like this 4 fifth space there, this 4 fifth space of the fractional quantum ball effect, is well described by the k equals 5 topological field theory and the advanced universal design. Unfortunately, this one is much less under well understood. Okay, so how does this work in a little bit more detail? Well, the fractional quantum ball effect, contrary to what I was saying about charges moving in a wire, uh, is something that you see in two-dimensional systems and the interfaces between two different crystals. And so, what do I seem to know? Where is my disk is moving right now. There you go. Okay, so the picture that I want is this. We've got a little, a little puddle of this fractional quantum ball effect that maybe has some defects in it. Maybe because we didn't design the crystal right, or maybe intentionally we put defects in the crystal to make little puddles where the fractional quantum ball effect wasn't taking place. And so this little puddle here is some two mantle. So a topological field theory is going to describe for us uh, some Hilbert space, and that Hilbert space seems to be the right Hilbert space to describe the ground states of these systems. And what we hope, and there's some evidence for, is that if you were able to manipulate these defects and move them around each other, the unitary operators that describe quantum mechanical time evolution would be exactly those unitary operators that the topological field theory describes for cohorts. I mean, so maybe it's not obvious, but, uh, but moving defects around each other is exactly what you would afraid. You imagine time is coming out of the page and you move these defects around each other, you're tracing out a grade. Okay. So Mike Friedman and his, his group at Station Q are really trying to implement all this 
studying fractional quantum ball effect systems and some other related things, and trying to work out the details of how you would put this all in practice to build a quantum computer using these sort of ideas. Uh, so I guess uh, here is just sort of a, a summary again of how you would use a system like this to do quantum computing. You take your quantum algorithm that computer scientists to pick up, you write down the corresponding unitary operator, you approximate that by some, some gradients that you can closely. You then move the defects and some fractional quantum ball effect system around each other in a prescribed way, and you perform a measure of the defects. That should have the same computational power as the, uh, as the quantum computer you wish to have installed here. Okay, so finally, a little bit of mathematics. Um, nothing that I've said so far uh, has been done by me, uh, and so but since I'm giving a math talk, I'm going to say kind of a little bit about, about what I've done, and so I'll do that in the next two or three minutes. Uh, so a lot of what I've been interested in is understanding what topological field theories are out there. There are these two extremely interesting ones that you can actually see in the, in the real world so far, but it would be nice to know what you might see next, what field systems should go and look for in other systems, uh, and, and what they should look like. So uh, a two-dimensional, uh, two plus one-dimensional field theory comes in, in, in several different flavors, and the nicest one is something called fully extended topological field theory. Fully extended roughly means that you can calculate this vector space for a surface and these unitary uh, operators for the three manifolds by cutting the manifolds into very small pieces, computing something for the species, pieces and assembling the answers by some algebraic operations. And in the case that, you're, uh, that you've got a fully extended field theory, it's completely determined by a piece of, of algebraic data called a fusion. And fusion categories are, in some sense, a common generalization of finite groups and quantum groups, but it turns out there's more out there besides these two classes of examples. A lot of my work recently has been trying to classify these fusion categories and uh, both classifying the small examples of them, constructing new examples that you haven't expected to see before, and this is very closely related to the stuff that I talked about yesterday in the operator algebra seminar about classifying subgroups. Okay, so I just want to finish with uh, some questions about about topological field theories and their relationship to quantum computing. So uh, some topological field theories uh, are, are nice in a different way, rather than being fully extended, they're what's called modular, uh, which involves having some, some well, the, the break group is somehow involved in this structure. And there are, there are two very nice conjectures about uh, modular tensor categories. The first one, Raoul's conjecture, which is that given any modular tensor category, you can build a quantum computer, you can simulate a quantum computer using it, as long as it's not weakly integral. So the weakly integral says that the, uh, the dimensions of the objects in this category are square roots of dimensions. And so uh, this would be very nice if you could prove this had uh, an explanation of what exactly we need for simulating quantum computers. I mean, Oscar, although maybe I'm misattributing it, it may be a I don't know if he said this in a field, but I've heard it say. So. Uh, his, his conjecture is that this condition of being weakly integral is equivalent to being weakly group-like, group which basically means that it's sort of not very interesting, that this thing is constructed from <laughs> finite group data. Uh, and so putting these conjectures together, uh, we might expect that those modular tensor categories, which are useful for quantum computing, are exactly the complement of those ones that, that purely came suggests that, that we, we should try and learn more about these exotic ones, these exotic examples that don't come from science group data. Okay, thanks very much. to be different notions of, a, of, a, of, a, of evaluating the Jones polynomial turn out to have hugely different 
computational complexities. So these theory we're just talking about today were about additively approximating particular values, and they were equivalent to quantum computing. It turns out that multiplicatively evaluating, that is knowing to within a fixed ratio, is actually sharp p hard, which is vastly more difficult than quantum computing. Uh, and uh, in particular, that means that knowing the polynomial exactly is, is sharp p hard, because if you have the polynomial exactly, you can do multiplicative approximations for evaluations. Um, 